Okay, now I'm rolling. All right. <laughs> I priest the button. No. I haven't done that one on the show in a long time. We haven't done anything on the show in a long time, sir. Uh, I suppose that's true. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hey everybody, welcome to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. Oh, and I'm Rish Outfield. Welcome. Welcome to the show, Rish Outfield. Welcome to you, sir, and welcome to the two listeners that have come back. <laughs> that are still subscribed after our, what? what is this, 10-month absence? Something like that. Oh, well. I think the last thing we did was Christmas stories, so... <laughs> yeah, well, we that's technically not the last thing that we did. That's true. We just put up the interview with Jason Sanford like a week or two ago. It's Jason Sanford month here, everybody. I hope you're all excited for Jason Sanford. But it's gotten so commercialized. I just, and now there's the ugly Jason Sanford sweaters that people wear, like, ironically. Oh. Yeah, that's true. It, it does take some of the fun out of it when you just feel like a corporate tool. When you put up your, uh, Jason Sanford ornaments on your Sanford tree, on your <laughs> thorn tree. Oh, hey, somebody's been paying attention. So we're, we're, we're presenting a story by Jason Sanford today, uh, which, depending on your memory, is either brand new or a rerun. It's, it's not a rerun from our show, but... If you listened to that interview that we did with Jason, uh, we first became aware of him through doing this story when thorns are the tips of trees for the Starship Sofa podcast. I, uh, big, what would it sound like for us to be on the Starship Sofa podcast? First of all, uh, you got that great Geordi accent, so... Tony would welcome you. Hello and welcome. Thank you. Uh, Starship Sofa. <laughs> welcome to Starship Sofa. <laughs> and then you would listen to the show for, I think, about four hours and 17 minutes. And that is when uh, our story would start. Uh, this was back in the old days when Tony did his Oral Delights podcast. <laughs> Did you really say that? <laughs> Which, I don't know. I mean, I'm assuming he called it that on purpose, like, as a joke. But that seems like even a worse mistake than calling your podcast the Dune Steef. Wow. What does the word Dune Steef mean? But maybe for a different reason. Yeah. You get people disappointed who turn into oral delights. Yeah, you, I mean, they tune into Oral Delights and they're like, there was no oral anything in this. It was all anal. <laughs> None of that talk now. <laughs> Wait, what? So, I'm sorry. We've got a bad connection. It sounded like you said, never mind. <laughs> yes, never mind. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, after having that conversation with Jason, where he was talking about his new book, the, a, a Plague Birds novel that you can buy I asked him if he wouldn't mind if we ran that story on our show. And I mentioned it to you because I thought, well, you know, the story is already done, but we could talk a little bit about it. And hey, we could have a new episode. And you agreed. And so here we are. Face to face. And this, you know, a, a couple of silver spoons. <laughs> and I'm hoping to find. <laughs> but, but both of us listened to this story this week. And, I, you know, cards on the table. I hadn't listened to this since 2008. We did it in 2008 and it aired in 2009. And I, well, we can talk about it after the story, but you produced the episode. And so this is like vintage Dutton Steve back when 
We put our all into these darn episodes. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. This is the vintage, you know, I, I don't know. I felt like it was a big draw for some people, you know, to listen to a story where we did so much more than the other, you know, we did the full cast, we did the sound effects and all that kind of stuff. And I felt like that that was, should be a big draw. And I think for the most part, it was, there were certain people who just hated that. So every now and then we'd get comments on like iTunes and stuff like that. We're like, they said this was just a story podcast, but it's not. Don't be deceived. They have girls reading girl lines and boys reading boy lines and there's sound effects. Don't listen. <laughs> One star. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we got a few of those. But yeah, I don't I loved doing that at the time it took uh, I'll have to admit an awful lot of effort you know I, I think that it was new and fancy or something like that I really enjoyed doing that kind of stuff so that is what we've got in store for you guys when you listen to this podcast and um, if you remember those days if you miss those days uh, this can be a blast from the past if you never heard this before it'll be like a blast from the past and all new. It'll be like, you know, when they all of a sudden put out that Nirvana song with Kurt Cobain singing that, you know, like had been tied up in the courts because Courtney Love was, you know, suing. And so the guys from the band had to sue back. And then all finally it came out in like 2004 or something like that. It'll be something like that. Because me and me and Rish finally settled our suit, so <laughs> we can't be in the same room together. But we we're able to podcast slightly uh, professionally. Yeah, that's right. Are, are we doing a story today or what? Before we run the story, let me bring bring in a special guest, announcer man, ladies and gentlemen. Why did I even show up today? Well, because I needed somebody to say about the author. Could could you do that, please? Please? Did Mrs. Outfield ever have any children that lived? Right. He, no, no. I, all I need you to say is about the author and then go back to retirement. Please. Uh, Big, will you ask him? Just yeah. maybe, maybe he'll do what you say. An answer, man. Pretty please. Will you give us the about the author? About the author. Thank you. <laughs> Jason Sanford is an American science fiction author whose short fiction has been published in Interzone, Asimov Science Fiction, Analog Science Fiction, and Fact, Year's Best SF, Intergalactic Medicine Show, and Ye Old Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. He is a three-time winner of the Interzone Reader's Poll, a three-time finalist for the Nebula Award, and a finalist for the 2021 Hugo Award for Best Fan Writer. Oh! And he killed him a bar when he was only three. <laughs> That's right. And also, he's got a book available called Plague Birds right now. Link is in the show notes. If you like Jason Sanford, you should pick up that book. Like Big did. That's right. So there's Jason Sanford for you. Enjoy the story and we'll see you on the other side. Thorns are the tips of trees by Jason Sanford. As I walked the heat cracked sidewalk in front of Shauna's house, she surprised me by blowing me a kiss from her bedroom window. A kiss I knew she'd never actually give. Even though I was mad at her mother for forbidding Shauna from seeing me, I blew a kiss back, only to have her mother evil eye me from their garden. I ignored the look and kept walking. Shauna's mom had hated me ever since I held her daughter's hand last month. Never mind that Shauna and I had both been wearing gloves at the time, meaning I hadn't technically touched her skin. When Dad heard of me holding hands, he'd stayed calm and muttered about raging teenage hormones. But to be prudent, the next morning he drove me to the town's pharmacy, 
where the doc doubled my weekly dose of inhibitor. Better safe than stiff, Dad said with a smirk. But I didn't have time to worry about Shauna, or her mom, or even my dad's lame sexual innuendos. The sun was setting, and it wasn't safe to stay out after dark. Shauna's was the last maintained house on the block. Just down the street, pine trees and kutsu sprawled across abandoned lawns and burned-out homes. Amid all this green lay the ruins of Brad's house. The old swing set we played on as kids was tipped over in the corner in the front yard. The reds and blues of its molded polymers faded away, and small pines growing through the frame. The clubhouse we built in the old tree hung half-rotten, the tree itself almost buried in a sea of kudzu vines. I sneaked around to the backyard where the grass looked like prairie, and the second-story windows broken by last year's hailstorm hadn't been replaced. The only place the weeds and kudzu and pines hadn't invaded was the small, well-trimmed spot in the middle of the backyard where a single thorn tree grew. The lights were on in Brad's house, and I watched his father's silhouette pace around the living room. I figured he was too drunk to notice me, but when I tried sneaking into the yard, Brad's old German shepherd barked and chased me back out. But then the dog recognized me. Sarge! I whispered. Sarge patted over and whined as he licked my face. And then he walked back to the thorn tree and laid down under its scraggy branches. I sneaked across the yard and crouched behind the thorn tree. The tree, two meters tall, with silver branches and needles crooking left and right like frozen lightning, was sickly and dangerously thin. When I pulled off my gloves and grabbed a needle, it shattered with a musical chime. Sarge whined from the dusty groove beside the tree trunk, where he obviously spent most of his time. Being more careful, I pushed my index finger onto another needle. A drop of blood ran onto the needle as cold rushed through my veins. Hello, Miles. Brad said, emerging from the fog of too much time alone. Do I even want to know how long it's been since your last visit? Two months, I said, feeling both guilty and relieved that Brad still seemed so fresh. Too often, Thorne's memories and personalities stiffened and decayed as they were left alone for long periods of time. Brad laughed at my <laughs> guilt and relief, the same high-pitched cackle he'd used when we were kids. Not, of course, that I actually heard him. When talking to thorns, it was best to keep your eyes closed. That way your mind turned the thoughts and feelings into words. With eyes closed, the person might almost be sitting next to you. Almost. So what, so what made, made you, you finally visit? visit? Brad asked. I started to make up some excuse, but it's pointless to lie to a thorn. Brad knew I hated seeing him in this situation. Eileen was mad at me, I finally confessed. Wouldn't speak to me unless I checked on you. Brad smiled. No one really cared for him anymore. His mother moved away last year, wanting to be near the safety of a big city. And his father drank too much and barely got by. He only talks to me when he's almost comatose. I can taste the alcohol in his blood. Never tells me about his life. Just jabs his hand over and over on my needles. For a moment, I opened my eyes and glanced at the living room window, where Brad's father sat drinking a beer. As I shifted, the needle in my finger broke. I pulled the tip out of my skin and found another needle to impale myself on. You're really brittle, I said. The water was cut off a while back. Dad can't pay the bill. I cursed. I should have checked on him before this. What with the drought we've been having, I told Brad to wait, then grabbed an old bucket and sneaked back to Shauna's house. Shauna's mom was inside, but the sprinkler in her garden still ran. I filled the bucket and returned to Brad, flooding his roots. Sarge whined and climbed out of his hole. Before the water washed in, I thought I saw the glint of bones there, but I refused to look close enough to find out. I made several more trips before Brad had enough water, then stabbed my finger again. Even though the sun was setting and I needed to get home, I opened my memories to the story Eileen had created just for Brad, a haunted tale of lovers kept from one another by cruel fate. Brad cried in my mind as he listened. Even though I'd heard many of Eileen's stories, this was her best yet. When I was done, Brad thanked me and said to give his best to Eileen. When I reached home, I wanted to tell Eileen how much Brad had loved the story. However, it was already nighttime, and shrieks and perverse giggles rose from the fields behind our house.
Not daring to find out what waited in that dark, I rushed inside and locked the door behind me. The next day, I worked with my dad tossing bags of mulch and manure on the back of our flatbed truck as the sun climbed hot into the sky. We were landscaping the Memorial Grove in the rich part of town. Even though it was still morning, the heat swamped me as I sweated through my long sleeve shirt and gloves. I'd strip them off in a second if we were at home, but people in this part of town would freak if I showed skin and Dad might lose this job. Couldn't risk that with work so hard to come by. After I finished unloading, my dad patted me on the back, a rare touch, even in his gloves, and told me to work on the trees in this area. He'd drive to the other side of the grove and deal with matters there. I nodded knowingly. Mrs. Blondheim, the fanatical town matriarch whose money maintained this grove, had complained about two new trees from Thorndye who'd sneaked into the park last week. She wanted them removed. I hated killing thorn trees, so my father always handled that chore. After my dad drove off, I added the mulch around the tree trunks and dragged fresh bags deeper into the grove until I couldn't see anything except the glow of hundreds of silver trunks and branches and thorns. All the trees were at their full growth of two meters, a height they'd achieved in the explosion of growth right after death. Near the center of the grove, I accidentally brushed against an old tree, and a thorn stabbed through my shirt. Jackie, a cute-faced nine-year-old who turned thorns several decades ago, said hello. The fogginess of her thoughts told me no one had talked to her in years. Not wanting to be rude, I held my bleeding arm against her long enough to say hello back. Have you seen my doll anywhere? She asked. Don't give it to me on my last visit. She'll be mad if I lose it. I didn't know what to say. How do you explain to a child that can't grow up, or even change, that her mother was long dead? That the doll had existed only in her mother's mind, and with her mother gone, there's no way to find it. Because of the thorn connection, for the briefest moments, Jackie seemed to understand what I was thinking. My mother's not dead. She cried before the built-up static of a hundred years returned her to the fresh-faced nine-year-old she'd been moments before. Have you seen my doll? She asked as innocently as before. No, I told her gently, but I'll keep an eye out. I then pulled my arm away and wiped off the blood before returning to work. At lunchtime, I sat down in the middle of the grove and ate my sandwich. The wind blew through the silver trees to the sound of a thousand begging whispers, but I resisted the urge to talk to any of them. I thought about visiting Mom's tree, but decided to wait until I was off work in case Mrs. Blondheim came by. Mom turned thorn when I was nine. Even though we hadn't the money to put her in a fancy grove like this, the thought of Mom growing here had obsessed me. Dad tried to tell me that Mom was dead that her thorn tree was merely an echo of Mom's soul. But I begged him without stop for days until he made a deal with Mrs. Blondheim, trading a cut in his pay in return for her taking Mom's tree. At the time, I'd been thrilled. Now, I wonder if I did the right thing. I also wondered about the people who created the phage responsible for all this. A few fanatics like Mrs. Blondheim still praised the gene to virus as creators for giving beauty and eternal life to our world. Most, though, cursed them as simple and viral terrorists. Whatever the intention, the phage had removed the most basic aspect of human culture. Touch. Almost 90% of humanity carried the phage. But it was only activated if you touched someone with the same phage combination. Since the phage continually changed versions like a madly spinning lock, the odds that touching any one person would turn you thorn were not extremely high. However, a person you could safely touch one day might be untouchable the next. I thought about Shauna. Despite the treatments my father gave me, I wanted so bad to touch her, to hold her, to kiss her. If we were married... And maybe we could afford to be tested to find a safe day or two in which to touch. If she bore my child, it would be safe for her to touch the baby as long as she breastfed the child and shared the same phage combinations. But I wouldn't be allowed such tenderness. Maybe someday, my child and I could be tested. So we could share a hug like my father and I did after Mom died. But as I constructed my life to come, I shook my head. 
The people who made this curse deserve the worst hell humanity could ever create. Maybe that was their intention. I finished my work by four and drove home with Dad, trying not to notice the crystalline dust coating his pants. He hated killing thorns, and would probably retire to the living room tonight to watch old movies and drink whiskey. After dinner, I checked the solar panels on the roof and the batteries in the basement, then reset the motion detectors and fluorescence. Once everything checked okay, and with darkness still an hour away, I figured I had enough time to visit Aline. I grabbed my shotgun and told Dad I'd be back by sunset. Unlike most thorn trees, her crystalline limbs shone with a faint blue hue. While Eileen and I had been friends since childhood, I'd only gotten to know her after she and Brad ran away at age 13. Brad returned nine months later, infected and nearing his end. No one knew where Eileen was until I found her tree growing on our property. She later told me she'd been trying to reach Brad when her guts exploded and she fell to the dirt, screaming and begging for more time. I sat beneath Eileen's limbs, closed my eyes, and eased my palm onto a thorn. She suddenly appeared beside me, smiling, then leaned over and hugged me. While I knew the forbidden touch existed only in my mind, I still shivered with excitement. I was also amazed at how clear the connection with Eileen was. She rarely showed the fogginess most thorns fell into after a few hours alone. Even my father, who refused to talk to any thorns, including mom, had said hello to Eileen once, remarking later that she was indeed different. He'd also noticed that a few of Eileen's thorns still appeared to be growing, something most thorn trees stopped doing shortly after their first burst of creation. How's Brad? She asked. I opened my memories of Brad. Eileen frowned when she saw that Brad's father hadn't been watering him. Thorn trees needed more water than ordinary trees to survive. Since the drought began, I'd hauled water to Eileen twice a week. It's my fault, I stammered. I didn't know his father would get his water cut off, but I'll stop by and water him from now on. Eileen thanked me. Anything new with Shauna? She asked. She blew a kiss at me today. But her mom's still mad at me for holding her gloved hand. <laughs> Eileen laughed. <laughs> That'll make Shauna want you even more. Nothing turns a girl on like a bad boy. I started to question if Eileen was the best one to give advice about a bad boy, since Brad had turned her thorn. But I liked Eileen too much to say that. Of course, since our emotions and thoughts were coursing as one through my veins, she knew what I was thinking almost before I did. She laughed then cocked her head sideways in my mind. For what it's worth, Mr. Miles Stanton, you're too nice a guy to ever be bad. But it'll still help if Shauna sees you as forbidden fruit. Not that what you feel for her is anything more than base horniness and mild infatuation. I sighed. It was pointless to argue with her over what I felt or didn't feel towards Shauna, because Aline would simply say she saw my motives with more clarity than I could ever muster. Still, it irritated for Eileen to dismiss so easily my love for Shauna. Eileen and I then talked about her story and Brad's reaction to it. Back in school, Eileen had been the best writer around, with some of her romances picked up by the larger net zines. She still created stories, but now Brad and I were her entire audience. I'd once tried to write the stories down, but the pictures she crafted in my head refused to match any words I knew. I asked Aline if she had any new stories. In response, she sang a beautiful tale of a princess lost in a big city. But halfway through the story, just as the princess was about to find the magic key to take her home, Aline stopped. Someone's near us, she whispered in panic. I tried to wake up, but Aline's thorn trance was so strong I couldn't wake. Suddenly, Aline's trunk vibrated and the thorn in my palm shattered. I fell back into the dirt with a start. When I looked up, the sky above was dark except for a few moonlit clouds scudding by. I jumped up, afraid. The only people out at night were thorn dye. Eileen's limbs and trunk glowed with the slightest of bioluminescence. I cursed softly, grabbing my shotgun off the ground as I wished I'd brought my full-spectrum flashlight. 
It wouldn't stop determined Thorndye, but it might scare them. Being killed rarely scared Thorndye. Pain usually did. I edged away from Eileen until I reached the dirt road. The road ran between my father's fields and the scrub forest that had grown up on the abandoned suburban lands. Perfect place for an ambush. Still, I had no choice. I ran down the road as fast and quiet as I could. I saw the porch lights of home, saw my father standing outside looking for me, and I started to relax. Suddenly, three people stepped from the dark shadow beneath the tree. I turned to run, but more people surrounded me. I aimed the shotgun at a woman standing in front of me. She was half naked, her breasts showing the faint glowing streaks of infection, snaking through her body. Hold me. She moaned seductively before laughing. (laughs) One of the men next to her giggled and hugged the woman. He was naked, as were most of the others around me. The phage drove Thorndye almost insane with a desire to touch other people. But what made the man stand out were the tattoos of numbers across his chest and arms. Prime numbers and base pairs, quadratic equations, and Einstein's famous E equals MC squared. The tattoo's dyes had attracted the phage infection, so the numbers glowed faintly as he moved. I had never seen this many Thorndye at once. I aimed the shotgun from one to the next. If I shot one, the others would be on me before I could pump another shell into the chamber. One of the Thorndye reached for me, but the tattooed number man pulled him back. My apology, the number man said. The phage screams at us during end stage, especially around uninfected like you. I nodded in false sympathy. I understand. Now, if you'll just get out of my way... The group tightened around me. First, I'm curious about the thorn tree you were talking to a few moments ago, the man said. She's a friend. I take care of her. That obviously wasn't what the numbered man wanted to know. But before he could be more specific, the half-naked woman beside him jumped at me. I fired the shotgun at her chest. Seeing an afterimage of blood and glowing tissue imploding as the numbered man screamed and tried in vain to stop the other thorn die from attacking me. I knocked one thorn die away with the gun's butt, dodged another, and started to run when someone grabbed my right leg. I stumbled to the ground trying to pump the next round in the chamber, but the others were almost on me. Suddenly a shotgun blast rent the air, then another. Then a third. I rolled over to find my father shooting the thorn die. I grabbed my own gun and crawled over to him. By the time I'd pumped a new shell, the remaining thorn die were gone. My last glimpse being the number man as he bolted through the darkness. The shot ones screamed on the ground as their torn bodies raced to take root before death. Come on! Dad yelled as he grabbed my arm and dragged me to the house. There's too many of them! We ran as fast as we could, still hearing the yelling and screaming even as we bolted the front door. Once my father made sure the thorn die weren't attacking the house, he grabbed my face in his ungloved hands and asked if I was okay. Did they touch you? Did their blood spatter on you? I shook my head, shocked at my father touching me for only the second time in my life. He asked again if they touched me, but all I could think about was how warm his flesh felt on mine. I tried to remember if any of the thorn dye had touched me. The one who'd grabbed me had only gotten a hold of my pants and boots. And I didn't see any of their blood on me. But maybe someone had touched me. I couldn't be sure. Dad hugged me tight and mumbled a prayer as he picked up his shotgun. I'll stand first watch, he said. Outside, the screaming continued as the wounded thorn dye rooted their damned bodies to the ground. The sun rose silent, the wounded thorn die having truly died, the phage rebuilding their bodies into silicon and cellulose. Now that the sun was up, the thorn seedlings would grow quickly, reaching their full height within days as their bodies and sunlight were absorbed by a matrix a hundred times as efficient as a leafy plant's chlorophyll. As I walked around our house, I wondered where the other thorn die had holed up. Once you were infected with an active phage, exposure to the sun sped up the painful change, which was why Thorndye avoided sunlight and houses equipped with full-spectrum spotlights. 
Dad was hung over from drinking too much last night. He also felt guilty about being too drunk to realize I hadn't come back by dark, and worried that I'd gotten an active phage from either the thorn dye or his own touch. He opened our safe and took out all the money we had saved. We drove downtown to the pharmacy where Dad explained what had happened. The doc seemed sympathetic. You need to tell the sheriff about this, she said, as she took the money from Dad's gloved hand and counted it. I knew we didn't have enough for a single test, let alone two. But to my surprise, the doc handed back some of the money and told me to step over for my blood sample. Dad wasn't getting a test, even though he'd touched me. I protested, but the doc whispered, shut up and act like a man. Odds are you'll have the same results, she said. The test took four hours to run, so Dad and I walked down to the sheriff's office. Sheriff Alice Coffey said she'd heard reports of several large Thorndike groups moving through the area. There have been a few reports like this over the last few months, she said. Groups of Thorndike move through an area and attack any memorial groves they find. Evidently, they've been undergoing some type of revival-like movement, which preaches that memorial groves are sinful. But it's difficult to get specifics on what they're up to. The sheriff suggested we move closer to town until this passed, but Dad said we'd be fine. Then we drove uptown and landscaped the memorial grove until noon, then drove back to the pharmacy. I tried to stay calm while we waited for the dog, but my gut clenched and I could barely breathe. When she told me I was fine, my body shook so hard that Dad had to help me stand out of my chair. Figuring that I needed some time alone, Dad said he'd finish landscaping the grove. I drove over to Shauna's house, needing to talk to someone, but her mother eyed me suspiciously and said she'd gone shopping. I then drove home. I could see the thorn dye bodies near the fields. They looked like shrunken mummies, each desiccated body centered on a half-meter nub of silver reaching for the sun. Still needing to talk, I walked over to Eline, but words were worthless for what I found. Eline's trunk was severed, almost all of her limbs and thorns destroyed. A single limb remained, attached to a bare sliver of a trunk half dug out of the ground. Crouching beside her, I gingerly pressed my finger to one of her remaining thorns. She appeared in my mind, hazy, delirious, but alive. At first, she couldn't remember who I was, but then she accessed her memories and her remaining branch and smiled at me. She said the thorn die attacked her last night, that they broke her apart piece by piece as they giggled and impaled themselves on her needles. I ran home and returned with my work tools. I carefully dug up Eileen's roots, the shovel cracking through her sun-bleached bones. Then I wrapped her roots in a wet burlap sack and carried her to our greenhouse. I fussed over Eileen for the rest of the day. Dad joined me when he arrived home. We placed her under the grow lights in the greenhouse behind our house, soaked her in nutrient-rich soil, and did everything to keep her from dying. Dad figured it was touch and go, but said she might pull through. It's weird the thorn died doing this, he said later as we sat on the porch watching the sunset. I held my shotgun while an automatic rifle I'd never seen before rested on Dad's lap. I don't understand why they're attacking the memorial groves. I mean, they'll all be trees in a few weeks or months. Why attack their own? Dad said that as he'd left town, the sheriff and the fire departments were preparing for the worst and had called up their auxiliary officers. The National Guard was also out. But Dad and I didn't get hit that night. On the horizon, we saw fires in the direction of town and heard a number of gunshots. If the phones and general nets had still been up, we'd have known what was happening. But they'd been gone for the last decade in this part of the state, and the security nets were so overloaded we couldn't log on. So we sat on the porch all night long, slapping mosquitoes and waiting for first light. The next morning, the smell of smoke strangled the air as Dad and I drove to town. We first rode through the outlying subdivision so I could check on Shauna. We found her and Brad's houses burned to the ground. There was no sign of Shauna and her family, but one of their neighbors said Shauna and her mother had been hurt and were in the hospital downtown. 
When I walked next door to Brad's house, I found his father's charred body in what had been the living room. Brad's old German shepherd, Sarge, lay dead near the body, as if he'd been trying to protect his master. Out back, Brad's tree looked like it had survived, but when I touched a thorn to give Brad the bad news, the crystalline structure shattered to shards. Dad shook his head and said the fire's heat must have killed Brad, too. While I cried, Dad patted me on the shoulder with his gloved hand. I understood that even with Brad's death, it wasn't worth us risking another touch. We buried Brad's father and Sarge beside Brad, and I said a few words, telling Brad how much I'd miss him, how much Eileen loved him. We then drove to town. Burned barricades blocked most of the roads, with dozens of thorn-dye bodies laying around, some trying to root in the asphalt of Main Street. The National Guard still manned the barricades, and Dad didn't think we'd be let in. But to our surprise, a weary sergeant told us to go straight to the sheriff's office. Turned out, the thorn dye attack on the barricades and houses, no matter how bloody, had only been a diversion. A larger group attacked the town's memorial groves, smashing machetes and axes through the silver trees. Two groves in the poor outlying parts of town were totally destroyed, every tree missing branches and thorns, while the rich memorial grove Dad and I worked on had been partially damaged. We found the sheriff near several of the grove's oldest thorn trees, all of whom were Blondheim relatives. The old trees had half their branches hacked off. Hundreds of them attacked the grove, Sheriff Coffey said, led by some thorn dye named Chance with glowing number tattoos on his skin. Security nets say he used to be a math professor before the last university shut down. Anyway, we beat them off before they torched the whole grove. But instead of being content at that, Mrs. Blondheim's been screaming at me all morning for not doing more. At the mention of the thorn dye with the tattoos, I told Sheriff Coffey that he'd also attacked me. But she was distracted by the return of Mrs. Blondheim, who yelled at my dad to save her trees. We inspected them. Several were obviously goners, while a handful might be saved with quick action. I started to tell Mrs. Blondheim that no matter what we did, the trees had already lost any memories stored in their severed branches. But a stern look from Dad made me hush. I looked around the now unrecognizable grove, located Mom's tree, and went to talk with her while Dad and the sheriff hashed things out with Mrs. Blondheim. Mom was happy to see me, but then she was always happy now that she was a thorn. I told her about Aline and the grove being attacked, and how Brad and his father were dead, at which point I broke down and cried. (laughs) Mom held me tight and told me to hush, that everything would be all right. She talked just like when I was a child suffering from a terrible nightmare. Once I finished crying, she asked how Brad and Aline were. I stared at her deep, beautiful, blue eyes and saw myself reflected back as the child she'd known before she turned. To Mom, I'd never grow up because she couldn't change. The memories and soul burned hard and static and unbending into the tree's crystal structure. No matter what I did in life, Mom would forever be the same person as when she died. Even though I hated to lie... I told her Brad and Aline were okay. That's good, she said. Everyone needs best friends. Dad and I spent the rest of the day shoring up injured trees in the grove. By lunchtime, a large crowd of townsfolk had gathered, with people checking on the trees of relatives and friends or trying to help me and Dad. A National Guard captain stopped by at one point and almost started a riot when he suggested people pull back to the center of town tonight, where it'd be easier to protect against the next attack, instead of defending the Memorial Grove. Several townsfolk actually pulled guns on the captain, until Sheriff Coffey calmed things down by saying we'd defend everyone in town, including the thorn trees. When dusk was a few hours away... Dad loaded our tools in the truck and said we needed to get going. Sheriff Coffey urged us to stay in town, offering to let us room in her house. Dad thanked her, but said we'd be fine at home. 
As we drove away, we passed neighbors and friends preparing to defend the town and the memorial grove. I felt so ashamed at leaving that I sunk down in the seat to hide. I asked Dad why we couldn't stay in town. I wanted to defend Shauna, who was still unconscious in the hospital. I wanted to defend Mom's tree. I wanted to stand with my neighbors. But Dad said that sometimes it's best not to do what everyone else does, and left it at that. Over the next few days, the Thorndye attacked the town two more times. Dad and I took turns guarding our house at night. In the morning, we drove to town and worked at saving the trees. Sheriff Coffey said the security nets reported attacks on memorial groves in several nearby towns and cities. Once the Thorndye destroyed all the groves in a town, they tended to leave the remaining townsfolk alone. On the third day, I was finally allowed to see Shauna who was recovering from a nasty hit she'd taken to the head. For once, her mother didn't shoo me away. I blew a kiss at Shauna and told her to get well. Shauna smiled from her hospital bed and reached a bare hand out for me, missing my arm by a hair. Her mother giggled nervously and told me Shauna was still delirious. She, she'll be all right, she muttered she'll over right. and over. She w- she'll be all right. She'll be all right. When Dad and I returned home, I ran to the greenhouse to check on Eileen. She looked much better, with a number of needles budding from her trunk and remaining limb. I carefully pricked my palm. She's infected, Eileen said with a frown. What? Shauna. She's infected. That's why she tried to grab you. I nodded. Obviously, Eileen knew more than I did about how infected people acted. I tried to feel sorry for both Shauna and myself at the news, but after all the death and pain of the last few days, I couldn't move past weary numbness. How are you feeling? I asked. Better. It's funny how all that hacking and cutting didn't hurt. Just left me confused for a bit. I smiled. I've been helping Aline remember certain things, like Brad, giving her some of my own memories to replace what she was missing. Each new memory expanded the buds on her body. Eileen and I also talked about Brad's burial. She was trying to create words to put on his tombstone. I told her I'd carve the stone once all the craziness calmed down. Before I left, Eileen mentioned that she'd spoken with Chance, the numbered thorn die who'd hacked her to pieces. He was extremely sad at hurting me, but said one day I'd understand. He also asked for your forgiveness. I was a little confused by then, but I'm pretty sure he asked for your forgiveness, not mine, even though I was the one being torn apart. I asked Eileen why Chance hadn't finished the job and killed her. Eileen didn't know. She then told me to be careful. They're determined, she said. Nothing scarier in the world than a determined person. That night, Dad and I sat on the porch. There was only silence from town, the National Guard's full-spectrum spotlights casting a hazy glow above the pines and oaks on the horizon. Dad sat quietly, counting his ammunition, when we heard a giggle from the (laughs) darkness before us. You don't want to do this, Dad yelled. We ain't in your way. I agree, a voice called back. And I don't want to do this. But I do want to talk. Will you kill your spotlights? I started to say hell no, but Dad waved for me to go do it. I walked to the house and threw the switch for the front spotlights. However, I left the lights shining in the greenhouse out back. I didn't want these bastards to get near Eileen. I expected Dad to be mad at me for that, but he merely nodded in agreement when I returned to the porch. As our eyes grew used to the dark... We saw dozens of faintly glowing thorn die standing in the tree line. One thorn die walked forward. He stopped a few meters from the porch, glowing numbers covering his skin. Your chance, I assume, Dad said. You should know I'm pretty mad at what you did to Aline, and almost did to my son. Chance shrugged. 
tried to stop them from attacking your son, but they they wouldn't listen. I, I Anyway, I, I don't want to talk about all that. I'm wondering why you two aren't in town. Not our fight, Dad said. But I've seen you working in the Memorial Grove. Dad thought for a moment. I'm a gardener. I always have been. Helping the trees helps people feel better about those they've lost. But that doesn't mean I'm going to die defending the damn things. Chance smiled and clapped his hands. Exactly. That's what people miss. Those trees are just an unchanging echo of the person they used to be. Many of us Thorn die believe the worst hell we'll ever experience is being trapped for hundreds of years as we are at the moment we die. Kept like an old photo or video. Only taken out when someone wants to revisit old memories. Dad didn't say anything, but I could see he agreed with Chance's words. What about your wife's tree? Chance asked. Dad bristled at the mention of Mom and shifted the rifle in his hand. My wife is dead, Mr. Chance, and I don't appreciate you dredging up our private affairs. Chance giggled nervously. (laughs) Quite right, he said. That's exactly right. We won't be bothering you or your son, assuming you stay out of the fight. We'll still be working in the grove each day, Dad said. I wouldn't expect anything less. Chance thanked Dad and I, then turned and walked back to the tree line. He was already there when I jumped off the porch and ran after him. Wait! I yelled. Why didn't you kill Aline? Chance turned in the dark. I couldn't see his face. Only the glowing numbers across his arms and chest. Because we weren't trying to kill her, he said. We were helping her. None of us are the person we were yesterday. We're only truly alive as long as we keep growing. And sometimes to grow, you must lose something. You, of all people, should understand that. I protested, wanting more explanation. But several of the thorn dye in the darkness around me giggled in warning. I ran back to the porch as Chance laughed. <laughs> in the morning, I talked with Aline, telling her everything that Chance said. Aline seemed to have improved even more overnight with dozens of needle buds sprouting and several of her larger needles thickening into small branches. I'd never seen a thorn tree bounce back so quickly from near death, and Aline blushed at my compliment. Chance Chance might be right, right. Aline said. I feel so alive right now, like anything is possible. However, whatever Dad and I were doing right for Aline wasn't working for the trees in the Memorial Grove. Even though the thorn die hadn't attacked overnight, several more trees had succumbed to shock from previous injuries. Dad and I worked the best we could, splicing busted limbs and applying nutrients to gashes and cuts. But he told me few of the injured trees would survive. It was almost as if they lacked the will to live. I felt sorry for the dying trees, and when I realized one was the young girl who'd said hello to me the other day, I touched her needles, but her thoughts were so confused and diffuse that there was little consciousness left to comfort. I spent lunchtime with Mom, telling her about how good Aline was doing, about what Chance had told us. Of course, Mom forgot my words shortly after I spoke them. I wondered if I should do like Chance and cut off some of Mom's branches and thorns, force her to grow new memories in life. But I was too weak. I couldn't do that to Mom. As she hugged me farewell and said to watch after Dad, someone yanked me off her thorn. I fell back into the sun and stared up at the angry face of Mrs. Blondheim. Get back to work! She yelled. How dare you waste time when my trees are dying! I tried to tell her that the injured trees were going to die no matter what we did, because they stopped living years ago. But my back talk only made Mrs. Blondheim angrier. She began hitting me with her cane, telling me to go to work. to work. When Dad and the sheriff walked up, Dad calmly grabbed Mrs. Blondheim's cane in midair as it was about to strike me again. How dare you! Mrs. Blondheim spat at Dad. Dad yanked the cane away from her and handed it to the sheriff. We're done here, he said. Sheriff, if you need us, we'll be at our house. 
Mrs. Blondheim stared in horror at Dad. You will get back to work, or I'll have your wife's tree dug up. I'll hack it down like those scum did to the other trees. Dad glanced at Mom's tree, then nodded sadly. My wife died a long time ago, he said. There's nothing you can do to hurt her. Then he led me away. Mrs. Blondheim screamed at Sheriff Coffey to arrest us, but the sheriff ignored her. Other people who had heard Mrs. Blondheim's outburst walked away, shaking their heads. Two days later, the Thorndye attacked the Grove a final time. A few townsfolk still fought back, but the sheriff and the National Guard kept their people away from the Grove instead making their stand between the thorn dye and the living part of the town. As the sheriff told us later, there comes a point when you have to decide what's worth dying for. And for Alice Coffey, the dead weren't worth any more dying. The next morning, Dad and I walked through the splinters of the memorial grove. We found Mom's tree missing most her branches. I tried to talk to Mom to see if she was still inside, fighting for her life like Aline had done. But all I felt was silence. We dug up her bones from beneath the roots and buried her alongside Brad and his father. Dad said Brad's old backyard would make for a good burial ground. I agreed and drove back to our farm where I found Aline's bones. I carried them back and buried her next to Brad. I then drove to the hospital. Shauna was in a darkened isolation room. Her mom was talking to Mrs. Blondheim about planting Shauna in the rebuilt memorial grove. I tried to convince Shauna's mom not to do that, to instead let Shauna out of isolation, to enjoy her remaining months of life. And when she's dead, don't let her stay the same. Cut off her branches, force her to grow, and change. She'll thank you for it one day. But Shauna's mom and Mrs. Blondheim merely looked in horror at my suggestion, as if I'd told them to murder Shauna in her sleep. I started to argue but realized there are people you don't waste time arguing with. So I told Shauna through the isolation door that I loved her, then walked away. I finished carving the tombstones the following spring, taking extra care with the letters of Eileen's tribute to each person. Because she refused to create words for her own bones, I simply wrote the words, a friend, on her burial marker. I could tell she was pleased with that. Even though the thorn dye continued to attack memorial groves across the region, none ever again bothered Eline. When she was big enough, I planted her beside our porch so I could talk with her every day. Eline once again glowed a faint blue. And even though I hated the idea of doing so, I promised Aline that if she ever became stuck in who and what she was, I'd cut off some of her branches and thorns. Just so you can grow again, I told her with a smile. But I didn't have to worry about that for now. As I sat with my palm on Aline's needles, we shivered to the faint chill wind and listened to the crickets humming and watched the stars washing the sky. Feeling bold, I asked Eileen what made her want to live on and on. She laughed and hugged me (laughs) and kissed me on the lips of my mind until I forgot all about my question and simply kissed her back. Author's Note When Thorns Are the Tips of Trees was my second short story published in the British magazine Interzone and ended up winning their annual reader's poll for best story of the year, along with becoming an amazing podcast on Starship Sofa. I was just starting out as a writer at the time, and the reaction to Thorns really encouraged me to keep going with my stories. Years later, a writer I admire said that they'd given up on writing at the time, but their partner showed them that issue of Interzone and said to read my story. My story helped them return to their own writing, and that response means so much to me. To know one of my stories made a difference in someone's life, 
There are no words to describe that feeling. All right, everybody, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the story. You know what? I know Rish did. Yeah, I most definitely like? did. And I did too. I went on a hike this week up on a mountain and I tried to time it so that the story would last me the whole uh, hike. And boy, this story was long. I was surprised <laughs> because uh, when I got to the top of the hill, I thought, oh, well, I, this feels like the end of the story, but it wasn't. I had still a whole other half of the story to look forward to. And uh, boy, yeah, I probably had a big old creepy grin on my face, even while exercising, because the story was so good but not only that, dude, your production was excellent. <laughs> like, the hike. you had Foley work for footsteps <laughs> that I heard on there. I was just yeah. like, oh my gosh, he did footsteps. And like a little sound whenever somebody would touch a thorn. And there was the music and there was the, the various voices and things that we just could not be arsed to do after the first couple of years because it was too much work. It was too much headache. It was, it was misery to try and get that much stuff going on. And I, I was delighted to hear your daughter's voice as a child at the very beginning of the story, because she's a grown freaking woman now. And it sounded like, it, it, she, <laughs> you know, she was a little kid. Yeah, it, it, it was weird. I mean, a lot of that stuff was interesting for me because, as we said before, this was right kind of at the cusp of the Doonstief taking off and really getting going. We hadn't, A, we hadn't met all the many people that we eventually met in the podcasting community. And so our ability to get people for the various different voices, the various characters was really low. Couldn't we couldn't get Renee Chambliss and you know start going down the list of all the people that we could get. And on, on top of that too, uh, we may have had some people that we knew. Uh, I mean, Abigail Hilton does the uh, main uh, female character voice, the female that had the most lines. And at the time, she was like our one female podcaster that we knew that would do lines for us. But this story had everybody was a female. I think, you know, at the time that we did this, we probably knew three or four guys we probably could have called to get lines from. But like I said, we had one single female uh, podcaster that we knew that we could ask for stuff. And every character, you know, there was a doctor and there was a sheriff and there was the old lady and there was the little kid and there was the mom and there was uh a, a, or the would be girlfriend yeah i don't know if she had lines ever oh I think she okay she may have only just waved but i think we got her <laughs> mom um and then like one of the thorn die that like wanted to touch him that one time when they're all surrounding him that was also so there's so many all these characters it was weird for me because I was listening to it and I hear one voice, like I get to the doctor and I'm like, hey, that's Shelby, uh, who was somebody that I worked with back in the day. And I'm like, oh, right on. And then the the sheriff, oh my gosh, I kept hearing her voice. And I'm like, oh, can't think of who that is. It's been so long that I can't remember. That was another person I know that I worked with that I got to do that. Maybe, uh, I want to say maybe Amber. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, it's been so long that I couldn't remember it. But I have to admit that, yeah, when my daughter came up doing the child's voice, it brought tears to my eyes because she is a grown woman now. And it's only been a couple of months since she moved out of the house. That was kind of hard for me to deal with. Uh, it was a little easier for my son because, you know, he, he's a big six foot five man that generally should be able to take care of himself and all that kind of stuff when when your son has 
grown so much that he makes you look like a pip squeak, even though you're, you know, I'm I'm not a small person. <laughs> There's a reason they call me Big Anklevich. And yet still, I, I look like a midget next to my son. So, you know, it's not one of those guys that you feel like you gotta worry a lot for or that kind of stuff. But your daughters, you always feel, you know, that you gotta protect them. You're always... Uh, there for them in a different way than for your sons i guess and it was hard for her to move away on me like that and and then you know out of the blue in the middle of this story for her voice to just pop out at me like that i don't know it caught me off guard i guess made me think about how she's gone and i'm sad if i was to go back and listen through the old dune steve catalog though she would be everywhere in that because she did pretty much every child's voice <laughs> through the years because <laughs> she was the best actor of all the kids yeah she was quite good and i i never had to be on your end of trying to get the kids to do voices i know what a pain that is for my own show but uh it always seemed like from my perspective that she was willing to do it yeah uh, less grudgingly than your other kids and your wife yeah. None of didn't want anything to do with it, but yeah, she, I, I recognized her voice, and yeah. Uh, and speaking of my wife, her voice is in here too, <laughs> right? <laughs> and my sister, <laughs> really? Yeah, just so many. I remember when we first started the show, my family gets together like once a month for family dinners, and at this time. I would bring scripts with me and a recorder so that I could record my sisters doing lines. And I would just have like, you know, the month's worth, basically. You know, I was like, okay, we got this story, this story, this story, and this story. And I need these lines and I'd have it all set up so that I could just bring it and have them uh, read all the lines for me. While we were at the family dinner, you know, I'd just like take them off into a quiet corner and be like, okay, go. Here's here's what I need you to do. And that lasted for a little while until we finally met like Julie Hoverson and Abigail and Renee and et cetera, et cetera. You know, and then it was like, oh, I guess I don't have to do this anymore. That was, <laughs> made things a lot easier because I had to be really organized to be able to have all that stuff ready to go when I was going to be at their house organization is not really a strong point of mine it takes some serious effort for me to manage that yeah and like i i said on the hike it's just all sorts of fun things that i noticed and vocal effects and you know sound effects i remembered it being a couple of years later when you went way overboard with creating sound effects but Clearly, that was not the case for this story. And I, I think, if I rem am remembering it correctly, we considered it to be, you know, this great honor to be able to do this story for Starship Sofa. It was just an excellent story, unlike anything that we had been given before at, at this point. Uh, so we put our best foot forward, uh, going above and beyond, doing everything that we could to sound like the most professional, the most outlandishly <laughs> produced, overproduced maybe, because, you know, the Starship Sofa had thousands, tens of thousands of listeners, and we had eight. So, you know, it was, it was going <laughs> to be most people's introduction to us. Right. And then, again, I can't say enough about the story itself. You said when we were interviewing Jason that one of the things that most impresses you is, is his world building. Yeah. And the world that he's created in this story is awful, but relatable. And he doesn't dump all the information at the beginning to let you know just what the devil is going on. He lets it trickle out a little bit at a time so that I guess it, it carries you along the narrative. Your curiosity keeps you going he doesn't define what a thorn die is or, you know, stuff like that. You figure that out when they appear. And it, it's something that I'm not able to do for the most part in my own writing. It's a really 
artful way of telling a story. Yeah. Of keeping things kind of hidden from the listener or the reader for them to discover on their own. But you're also trusting that your reader is going to come along and stick with it long enough to find out what you're talking about. It's a skill that it takes to, you know, to learn that. To basically, you you have to learn how to trickle it out and the right amount to trickle it out so that your readers don't get so confused that they're like, oh, F this, and they just put the story down. But you don't want also to bore them off of the top of a story with a giant info dump that it is the year three, <laughs> you know, it's just some giant thing where you're just like explaining and explaining. And then finally you get around to the story, you know, you got to, you got to walk the tightrope, I guess. And, and that's something that Jason's really great at. All of his stories have unusual worlds, you know, it's not just, Although I guess, well, no, this one's still pretty, got a lot of stuff in it. At least this one's set in what feels like modern day Earth, America, which everybody can relate to. But there's so many other things going on with the thorn trees and uh, the thorn dye and what what the disease or whatever uh, you know, how it spreads and, and all that kind of stuff that he's trickling out to you, which is really interesting. But, you know, talked about Plague Birds, which is his book that's out right now. And that one is far future to the point where he was saying in the interview that he had a hard time selling the book to a publisher because they would read it and go, yeah, this is great, but we don't know how to market it because it's kind of science fiction and it's kind of fantasy and it's kind of just a little of different things and we don't know what to do with it and so i guess we're not going to buy it from you (laughs) and that's the same kind of a thing where he's got this world that's so different and he still just meets out the information to you in you know a slow and perfect way and and that stuff is uh Something that I think I've sometimes in my own writing managed to achieve and other times utterly failed (laughs) to achieve. I was just reading through an old story that I wrote like this week and I was thinking, oh man, this needs like some rewrite in it because there's a whole bunch of times where I just (laughs) info dumped. I montaged my way into the next thing. Yeah, definitely a skill I've got to uh, improve upon. You mentioned his struggles with uh, selling his book to publishers. That's another thing that I noticed about this story uh, as I was listening, is I don't know how I would uh, categorize it. Because it, it's kind of a fantasy story. It's kind of a post-apocalyptic story. It's kind of a Western, kind of a horror story. And then, you know, obviously science fiction as well. I, it just mixed all sorts of stuff in a very unique blend. And it felt topical. It felt like something that somebody had written about the pandemic and not being able to touch people anymore, get close to people anymore. Even though, you know, it was years and years ago that he wrote it. Right. Uh, I think he published it in December of 2008. I found that kind of moving too. the the relationship between Miles and his old man and his dad spoke to me. And I, I would imagine it spoke to you as well. Both of us have lost our fathers in the 10 years since this, since we did this episode uh-huh. and uh, Miles's dad who loves him, but can't touch him. You know, it's potentially deadly to touch somebody and he tries to comfort him and tries to be a good father to him or whatever. That really spoke to me. That that moved me. This story was just, yeah, it, uh, gosh, it did everything. Yeah, it is really similar to my own dad in that the mom is gone as well. The mom has become a thorn tree. I mean, he can prick his palm and uh, visit her in a way... But uh, she's not around, and, and the dad 
is in the middle of all this and trying to do all those things by himself. And, and, you know, he's doing what's generally traditionally the role of the mother, you know, a lot of those things, trying to show the love. And, and he can't even do it the traditional way. He can't just give his kid a hug. Uh, I guess he could if they got all into some kind of uh, hazmat suit or just had long sleeves on and a balaclava a ski mask. But but yeah, the the distance that must be pushed into that relationship uh, and he's still trying to deal with that, that's a, a really poignant kind of a thing. Which speaks a lot to me because, yeah, I mean, my dad was that way after my mom my mom passed away when i was 15 and uh, there were several years before my dad got remarried yeah it was it was difficult it was a hard time with just him and us kids that were remaining a lot of my sisters and brothers that were older tried to help him out as much as they could even though they had their own families that they had to care for and yeah you know us still at home had to kind of grow up and be in charge ourselves of ourselves i mean obviously you can see that i failed at that because i never grew up if you've seen my toy collection you know (laughs) but yeah that that was i guess a little bit of what miles had to go through you know he he was working with his dad day in and day out I, i don't even know what the world has to be like they never mentioned school in the story at all I don't know if that means there is no school or they do it all on Zoom (laughs) or or what. Uh, He's going and working with his dad day in and day out. And they did mention that like a lot of people had no jobs and, you know, towns, smaller towns like what they were living in were kind of hollowing out. Yeah, there's so much in this story that could be considered allegories to other things. All these other things that are kind of happening in our own world in, in one way or another. Or were predicted, I guess, like we're talking about with the COVID thing. You know, everybody's kind of moving away to the city and leaving the, the small town to dry up and wither away. And And the other thing, too, that I think is really interesting is just the thorn tree thing. Like, what would you do? If you could have a thorn tree. I thought about that a little bit because this kid pricks his finger and talks to his mom. But would you want something like this where you can talk to your loved one, but they're not really there? Like, you know, as it seems like the older the trees get, the more foggy they get, I guess their memories they said become rigid or something like that they do, they can't update their memories they don't remember new things they're stuck in one one place is that something you would want like say you like the the girl in the story the nine-year-old girl that became a thorn tree and he accidentally caught his arm on the thorn and she's like have you seen my doll (laughs) my mommy gave it to me i hope i don't lose it would you want that if your child passed away something that you could interact with them or would it be worse what would you think about that in the story you get both answers you get people like miles who enjoys talking to his mother, enjoys talking to his best friend, even though they're shadows of who they were. But then you've got his father, who's like, my wife is dead. You know what I mean? And to him, it's not worth the price. It probably hurts too much to see just a shell of who his wife was before his eyes. And so I I feel like maybe if you were the mother of a child who was very small, you would be okay with the child staying small forever because the children are simple and, and eventually they grow out of that and you long for when they were simple and you could just, you know, control them or entertain them or, or just hold them. And so I, I think for me, for the most part, I would be, enjoy it i think it would be cool to to go to one of those memorial gardens or whatever and just 
check in because because there are people that will do pilgrimages to a cemetery every year on Memorial Day or or their anniversary or the day of the death of their loved one or St. Crispin's Day. Is that what St. Crispin's Day is for? <laughs> I have no idea. It just came to mind. <laughs> and and I've never enjoyed that. I I that is not something that speaks to me because a stone is not my dead loved one. It's just dates and it's granite or whatever stones are made of. And yet there are people that can go to those places to a cemetery and they feel the presence of their loved one. They feel like if they talk to that headstone that their their dearly departed can hear them. And so, yeah, I think it's just your mileage may vary. Uh, there, There were some people that would love that and would want to go to one of those memorial gardens and see a vision of their dead spouse. And then there would be some that say, you know, that's not necessary. That's I, I would much rather she be cremated and thrown into the, the, the wind. And every time I feel the wind, I'll say that's her. You know, I, people are different. Uh, so I feel like I've played both sides there. Hope that's okay. Yeah, I can, I can understand that. I'm on your side of the fence as far as the gravestone thing goes. I could probably count on one hand the times that I went to my mother's grave. And like I said, that was, I was 15. So what is that? Like 30? Don't say it. 30 plus years ago. I'm not like that. I don't want to see the stone. I don't want to, that doesn't mean anything to me. I, I love looking at old pictures or video if there is such a thing, you know, depending on how old a person is, there could be video or eight millimeter film or something like that of the people. And I have been really into doing that. You know, I've scanned all the pictures from uh, my childhood and before that my family has. And I, you know, transferred the film uh, to digital so that I could look at the film and all of that kind of stuff. And that stuff, I suppose, is kind of like a thorn tree. Uh, when you think about it, you know, watching an old video, that video is not going to change. That video is always going to be the same, the same thing that's going to happen. And you're going to see the kid the same way or you're going to see the mom the same way or whoever it is that's on there. They're always going to be that same person. That can even be interesting when it comes to people that haven't passed on. You know, you were talking about children and, you know, you, you you long for the time when they were still simple and, and all that kind of stuff, when they still loved you or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and you can, with videos and pictures and stuff, that's what you can kind of go back to and just remember. Because, you know, we don't, people don't really remember, like, what somebody looked like 10 years ago or 15 years ago. I remember, I would say like 10 years after my mom passed away, I encountered a video of my family from Christmas in 1982. I watched that video and it was the first time that I'd seen a moving version of my mother, you know, since she died. And I was watching that and she was doing stuff that I remember my mother doing. And then she talked, she said something. And I didn't recognize her voice. It didn't sound right to me. It sounded off. I didn't know what to think about that. Was my memory corrupt? You know? And I asked my, I said it to my brothers. Like, was there, is there, is there something wrong with her voice? Does it sound like it's not the right? And he's like, no, that sounds like what she used to sound like. I said, oh my gosh, that's weird. Like, what is wrong with my memory of it? Why do I think it of her voice being different. Apparently it was, and you know, the 10 years, I guess, was enough for me to forget how it really sounded. That's one of those things that's really weird when you lose something like that. And I guess maybe that's an argument for thorn trees where you can hear their voice even though you're not hearing it. You're, it's being formed in your mind, so you're not actually hearing it, but... You know, you can experience what that person was like. It's like going to the Hall of Presidents and they stand up and say, I'm Abraham Lincoln or whatever. 
<laughs> kind of experiencing a version of something that doesn't exist anymore, so you can't have the real thing anymore. There's a lot to deal with when it comes to loss like that, and there's loss, you know, everywhere, really, you know? It's like the song I like to play on my birthday every year is that you're older than you've ever been, and now you're even older. And now you're even older, and now you're even older, and it just goes on like that basically through the whole song. Every moment that passes is another lost moment you can never get back. And every minute your child grows older or your grandma grows older or whatever is another one where you can't have back. And eventually they'll all be gone one way or another. I don't know if this ha was really a theme of this story. I didn't feel like it was, but it's... I guess a th theme that I've reached in our conversation here is just, you know, you've got to cherish every moment. Make sure to live them instead of, I don't know, staring at your phone all day long or something like that. <laughs> that phone you're not going to look back on and think, boy, I should have played more Tune Blast or friggin' Candy Crush. <laughs> but you will look back and say, I should have spent more time with my child. I shouldn't have just let them sit and look at their phone. We should have gone out and done something together. You're still there, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. I've talked for a really long time, so I thought I'd give you a chance. Well, it's just I had forgotten how long these episodes are. <laughs> I pity the poor sucker who has to edit it. Yeah, that guy's screwed. So, hey, I, you know, I want to thank Jason Sanford yet again for sharing his work with us. Uh, you know, he's always been a, such a good friend to us as, uh, you know, as a, a writer. And this story appeared in his very first short story collection called Never Never Stories. And if you get the uh, ebook version, it has When Thorns Are the Tips of Trees in it, Free Langa, Peacemaker, Peacemaker, Little Bo Peep and maps of the Bible in it, all of which we produced in audio. Feel free to, to, to go there and, and buy a copy of this. And if you read it and you love it, like I have loved Jason Sanford's stories, give it a good review on Amazon. I, I made the mistake of going to Amazon today and looking this book up. And boy, there needs to be like a hundred new five-star reviews on here. Some of the reviews are just brutal and, uh, and, and Jason deserves better. And so I'm just going to leave you with that. <laughs> if you don't mind, Big, if you could put a link to Never Never Stories on there. All right. Uh, right there by the link to Plague Birds. I can do that. And that one uh, is based on or... I don't know if I want to say based on, but that goes with the stories that we also produced in audio, Plague Birds, and the ever-dreaming verdict of plagues, two stories set in that universe. And now you can get the full novel set in that universe, so check that out as well. And give it a good review. What the heck? While you're there, come on. What, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Do it! Come on! Hey, Big, thank you for uh, sacrificing your evening yet again on the altar of the Dune Steef. It's been a long time. You get to go to sleep now. Yay. I like sleeping. I'm going to do it more. Sounds and good. And thank you, sir, for getting together with me, even though we uh, can't be in the same room with each other. Because of the phage. <laughs> That's right. Uh but yeah, it's uh, it's been fun. And we'll see you again sometime soon, folks. Soonish. <laughs> All right, I have been Rish Outfield. And I have been Big Anklevich. Edit in pithy quote here. All right, uh, I'll make sure to drop something super clever right there. You see? You see? Your stupid minds. Stupid. Stupid. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, man. Good night. 
See ya. Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Good night, announcer fans. Take two. You could send it to me real quick if you want, or you can just read it. I don't care. It's up to you. You have your email up? I will momentarily. Do you have your wheelie up? That's a quite a much more difficult feat these days. It's because you're not eating enough carbs. I press the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.